We are continuing in Genesis chapter 16, and you can turn there in, in your Bibles. We're not even a third of the way through the book of Genesis. Are you guys tired? No, I love it. I love it. We'll take some breaks here and there and stuff. Um, but also, if you, you're just really enjoying it, we continue these series on Sunday nights, and uh, there's a lot, been a lot of really great sermons given um, in context of Genesis. So if you look ahead and you see like, ooh, this next chapter looks interesting, you should come back on a Sunday night sometime. I know you'll enjoy it. The title of my message this morning is The God Who Sees. The God Who Sees. And I'm so thankful that the God of the universe, the God who created everything, the God who has all authority in heaven and in earth, is a God who takes uh, time to notice and attention uh, and pay attention to me. And he sees you. And he sees me and he sees our families and he knows our struggles. And, and I find great comfort that God hasn't just left us to figure life out on our own, but that God is a God who's involved. And if you came here this morning thinking, God, have you forgotten about me? Or have you, have you turned a deaf ear to my struggles, to my pain? to the suffering, to the situation that I'm at. God, where are you? Do you see me? Can you hear my voice? Can I just remind you that God is the God who sees and he wants to respond with his great love. The scriptures say that his heart burns with love for you and for me. And so this morning uh, at the end, we're gonna be ending with a time where uh, I'm gonna call people forward out of their seats that if you have a need, if there's something going on in your life, if the Lord begins to speak to you throughout this sermon, God sees you and he wants to meet with you this morning and he wants to minister to you just like he did in this text as we look at Genesis 16. So I want you to be ready. If you have a need or there's a need that is represented in your life, the altar is a place that we meet with God. It's not a place of judgment. It's a place where we can um, uh, just surrender the things that we're carrying so that the Lord who sees can, can move in might and power. Let's uh, read Genesis 16. You can follow along in your Bible or on the screens. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave, Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. And when she knew she was pregnant, she, being Hagar, Began, began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong that I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now she knows she is pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Verse six, your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think is best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. The angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son and you shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery and he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he will live in hostility towards all his relatives. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And that is why the well was called Bir Lahoi Roy. 
It is still there between Kadesh and Buried. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, and I pray that this morning that people wouldn't just hear words from my mouth, but they would hear a direct word from you this morning, that you would open up our ears, you would open up our eyes to hear and see the things of the Spirit, and that you would speak through me in a powerful way, and we would long to, to hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Now, you guys obviously noticed worship was a little bit abbreviated on the front side, and we're gonna have some time to worship, to encounter the Lord. And whether you respond to the altar or you're still in the pew, when we start altar time, that's not time for people to dismiss. The Lord wants to work. He wants to continue to work. If you have children, in the same way that we're having an opportunity to connect with the Lord, Pastor Courtney is giving opportunity to connect with the Lord. So beating the line actually causes disruption to children's church and prevents children from being able to hear from God. And there were times as a child that when given the opportunity to just have a moment that I heard from the Lord and it marked me. And I want that for you and I want that for any children that come to New Hope on a weekly basis. So at the end, we're not in a hurry. We've come here for one purpose. His name is Jesus, and he's got something for us all. Does that sound good? Man, well, I think there is a lot that I could say about this text, and I will say some, but I think the clear takeaway from this text is clearly this. Men, don't listen to your wives because it leads to trouble. <laughs> I mean, like, you look in... You look in Genesis, Adam, Eve, and she begins to tell her husband what to do and what is the result? Bad, right? Now you got Sarai telling her husband what to do and what's the result? Bad. Okay, I'm just teasing, guys. That's a, that's a, a really bad joke. Pastor August and I prepared this sermon together and he told me to say that. So if that offends you <laughs> in any way, He's right down on the north end of the hall. You guys can go take it up with him. That's his joke, not mine, okay? I'm going to work through this a few verses at a time, but I hope to do so quickly because I believe the Lord wants to speak something specifically and not just through me. He wants to speak to you this morning. Verses 1 through 3. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan for 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. Now there's four main characters in this story and in this chapter. You've got Hagar, you've got Sarai, you've got Abram, but who's the main character of the whole scripture, the whole story? God, right? You've got God as being the main character. But we're going to kind of take a look at these different characters um, throughout the day um, and this morning and the time that we have. So first, taking a look at Hagar. Hagar. Um, it's important to note that Hagar wouldn't even be in the picture and wouldn't be in this chapter had Abram just obeyed and stayed in the land that God had led him to, right? Had he not gone down to Egypt, Hagar wouldn't be in the picture. She's baggage from Egypt. And I'm not meaning to call her baggage, but we say this a lot, and I've said this before, and I will say it again. Disobedience always leads to drama. It always leads to drama. If you're a child and you disobey mom and dad, it leads to drama. If you're a child of the king of heaven, and you disobey, it's gonna lead to drama in your life. Now, some scholars think that Hagar was actually a daughter of Pharaoh. Um, we can't really confirm that, but where they get that is in the next chapter, um, in 17, verse 20, it's God blesses Ishmael and says, I'm going uh, to, to, to let you have all these children, and you're gonna have 12 princes um, in the NASB, it's princes. In the NIV, it's, it's rulers. But they believe that because there were princes, that this could have been Pharaoh's daughter. Um, 
Do we know that for sure? I don't know. I found it interesting. I had never heard that. I thought I'd share that with this morning. It doesn't really matter, but it's interesting. Taking a look at Sarai, okay? She's walked through a long season of infertility, and who does she begin to blame? She begins to blame God. She, she says this in our, in our text, the Lord has kept me from having children. Okay? They've lived in for 10 years in Canaan, and God's not doing what he said he was going to do. God's not fulfilling the promise that he gave us 10 years ago. And so she begins to say in her own heart, I will force God's hand into doing what he said he was going to do. I will take things into my own um, uh, strength and my own power, and I'm going to do what God's not doing. Pride that says, I'm going to do this my way, in my timing, never ends well. If you're in a season of waiting where you feel like there's promises or there's things that the Lord has revealed to you and you're just in that season of waiting and and it's a struggle and you feel like God has put this on your heart, can I just encourage you, wait and renew your strength in the Lord. Wait, be patient, call upon God and he will renew your strength. He will renew it. He will give you endurance to be able to endure until there is that season of, of, of life, of blessing. I have to wonder this in reading this text. Did Sarai, could it have been that she didn't believe the promise of God because she wasn't the one to receive it? Like scriptures, when you read scripture, it says that Abram and God were having these conversations that God was giving the promise to Abram, could it be that Sarai was just receiving these promises secondhand from Abram? You know, I think sometimes in our lives, we struggle to really believe the promises of God because you're taking your pastor's word for it rather than opening up the good book and reading them for yourselves. Sometimes we, we struggle um, really believing the promises of God, not just because they're slow and delaying and coming, but we're not calling upon the name of the Lord for ourselves. I don't want this church just to believe me and take me at my word. I want you to take God for his word. We need to be in the scriptures so that we know what he says without a shadow of a doubt. What he says about us is true. Don't, don't just take my word that God loves you and that he sees you. Look to scripture and, and become convinced yourself that he sees you, that he loves you, that he's for you, that he's with you, that he'll never forsake you. We can't take secondhand promises and be confident in them. We need to hear directly from the Lord and I believe that he wants to speak to you, receive them yourself this morning. Sarah is struggling to believe God for whatever reasons, and so what does she do? She uses Hagar as a surrogate. Now this is not an uncommon practice, and this wasn't an uncommon practice in the Mesopotamia uh, times, okay? There's two ways that this could have gone down. The first way is that Hagar conceived a child And then she would have then given that child, after weaning this child and and, and raising him a little bit, she would have given that child back to Sarai and continued to be her slave. And, And you see this like even in the story of Moses, when Moses was found in the reeds, you know, Moses was kind of seen as as Pharaoh's, you know, son in this time. And so that's one way that this could have gone down in this Mesopotamia culture that they're living in. The other way is that actually when someone was given um, as, as a spouse, that they would become the person of honor, that they would become the spouse. And there's kind of two different ways, but this was not an uncommon um, practice in the Mesopotamian culture. Now, culture said that this is acceptable, but we cannot allow culture to dictate how we obey God. And, and, and I'll just say this, because it's very easy to look at secular culture and be like, amen, brother, right? We can't, we can't let them pop artists, you know, dictate how we do these things, you know, and just whatever it is. Like, thanks for laughing at my joke, buddy. I appreciate that, okay? Um, it's really easy to kind of get into that mindset, but we can't, hear me, we cannot allow church culture 
to dictate how we respond to God. Well, I'm just gonna raise my hands because that's what everybody else is doing. I'm not gonna raise my hands because that's not what everybody else is doing. Well, so-and-so says that this is how much I should give or this or that. There's, a, you know, in church culture, mainstream America, there's a lot of unhealthy things that are going on. And if we just look to the left or we look to the right to say this is permissible, this is not, this is godly, this is not, guess what? We're always gonna come up short because we're taking our eyes off of Jesus who is the author and the what? The perfecter of our faith. He is the perfecter of what we do. He is the perfecter of who we are. We cannot allow culture of any kind to dictate how we obey God and, and, or, or disobey God. We need to set our eyes on him. I wanna ask you this morning, have you, have you um, allowed culture of any kind to dictate the way that you live your life? Or are you going straight to Jesus to hear what he wants for you and your family? The way that I parent my children, there might be some wisdom that I've picked up over the years, but it's different than the way that God wants you to parent your children. We can't look to the left, to the right. We need to look to Christ. So we've looked at Hagar and Sarai, but let's take a look at Abram. We see Abram, 10 years in Canaan, 10 years since the promise, and what does he start to do? He starts to go along with culture. He, he, he begins to reason, well, you know, maybe uh, this isn't an uncommon practice. Maybe God just wants to fulfill his, his promise through Hagar. That, that, that could make sense because it's, Sarah's getting kind of old, you know. Like, God, I don't know if last time you looked at her, you know. And he just begins to reason. God's ways are higher. Who can understand them? Do you struggle ask yourself and allow the spirit of God to speak to you this morning because I believe that this is a struggle for many people when it comes to the mysteries of scripture. Do you struggle with allowing your reason to rule? Do you, do you struggle with making decisions that seem correct up here but the Lord might be asking you to do something different? I'm currently right now wrestling with something in my life that I feel in my spirit that I'm supposed to do this. And I don't know it, that it's the best thing for me logically, but I feel like the Lord is leading me to do something that is a little bit scary, that doesn't quite make sense, that when you check it out on paper, you're just like, uh, I don't know that there's a lot of earthly wisdom to this. And I'm, I'm currently, right now, today, struggling with, with that. But I just need to turn to Jesus. I need to cry out to him. I need to remember that he's the God who sees me and that he will give me all that I need in wisdom and discernment. And he's not gonna leave me to, to just be hung out and dried out. You know, like, God, God is for me. God, help us live by your spirit and not by what we see. Let's continue, verse four through six. I'm gonna try to fly through this. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. And when she knew she was pregnant, she, Hagar, began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think is best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Now let's take again a look at Hagar. She begins to develop this elitist mentality. And then she begins to look down on Sarai and begins to mistreat Sarai. Could it be because she is kind of assuming the role as the wife of honor, you know? Could it be that she was fully aware of the promise that had been given to Abram and they had talked about this coming child, they had talked about this lineage that would be forever, that, that 
she obviously knew that, and she could be thinking in her heart, well, I'm God's chosen. God's choosing to, 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 to work through me. And pride manifests itself differently. And in Sarai, pride led to forcing God's hand, saying, I'm doing it my way, in my understanding. In, in Hagar, pride led her to treating Sarai horribly. I want to ask you this, and allow the Spirit to speak. Is there an area in your life that you struggle with having an elitist mentality? I think it's very easy just to say, well, that's not me. That's not me. No, that's not me. But is there an area in your life that you feel entitled because of your position? Maybe it's your wealth, and it's easy for you to look at people that don't have what you have, say, well, I worked hard. They can do this. Maybe it's looks and you're a beautiful person and you know it. And you look at someone who's struggling for whatever reason. Say, well, you know. But if it's your status or a title, you know, because you've got doctor in front of your name or you've got this in front of your name or whatever it is. Maybe it's, it's um, education and, and you've gone to school. Or maybe this church, 830, Maybe you struggle with an elitist mentality of, I'm more washed up than these other sinners. I'm more holy than these other people. You know, sometimes, just to be honest, sometimes I struggle when the Lord is taking me through a refining season and there's things that he convicts me and then I look in other people's lives and I'm like, how can you watch this? How can you do this? And then I have to realize, like, give me eyes of compassion. Here's what happens when we develop eyes uh, or a heart that is elitist or having an elitism mentality is that it robs us of compassion for wherever someone else is. They don't have because they haven't worked. They're still struggling because they're just not this. And, and we can lose our compassion by having an elitist mentality. Is the Lord knocking on your heart right now? Help us, Jesus, to be a church that walks in, in um, compassion. Sarai, at this point in our text, she's a hot mess. So first she's casting blame on God for her infertility, but now she begins to cast blame on Abram for her decision. Never taking responsibility for her idea. How quick are we, are you, am I, to cast blame on others or God for the situation that we find ourselves in. Well, if God would just answer my prayers, and God's like, well, if you would just listen to me. How, how, how quickly are we to cast blame? That's the opposite of humility, that's pride. Humility takes ownership. May we be a church that walks in humility and, and taking a look at Abram, okay? What, what is he doing? He's passive in leading, he's like, just do what you want with her. She's your slave, you know, and, and he doesn't call upon the name of the Lord. He doesn't consult God. He doesn't try to bring peace among Sarai and, and Hagar. He just kind of is like, oh, whatever, I'm out of here. Just like Adam in the Garden of Eden, he follows instead of leads. Can I just speak to the men in the room, and it doesn't matter if you're married or not, but can we step up and lead? And I'm not talking about in a domineering way. I'm not talking about an authoritarian, well, I'm the man, I'm the spiritual head in this household, and I'll do this and this, and you need to listen, and you need to mind. That's not godly leadership from a man. What godly leadership of a man is when you get down on your knees every day, and you say, Jesus, without you, I am nothing. I don't know how to parent well. I don't know how to be a husband well. I don't know how to do this in my business well. And I need your strength. Men, we have to step up and lead. We can't be passive. Your spouse, your children, your family, they long for you to be the leader. They long for you to be the one who is initiating. Let's go back on Sunday night and fill up with more of God because God is good. Let's, let's, let's spend some time in prayer. Let's spend some time um, just seeking God about this. Let's see what scriptures has to say. They're longing for it. Men, we need to step up and lead. It's quiet, men. 
Am I stepping on some toes? We can't just be doers as men. It's easy just to do, do, do. We need to be with God and he'll help us. Verse seven, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. Now, Shur in Hebrew means wall, okay? She's in this area of Israel, um, and, and it's not like modern day Israel, this is Mesopotamia, but there's a, a mountain edge with a steep rock face. Have you ever been standing in life at the edge of a wall where it just feels like, I, I don't know how I'm gonna get up this. I, I don't know how I'm gonna climb this. You're out in the desert, you're by a spring, you've got just enough to survive, and you're staring at this wall, and you're just thinking, man, how, how am I gonna do this? Feeling desperate, not knowing where to go. God will find you just like he found Hagar. And if you need to be found, and you feel like you're in a place of desperation this morning, can I just encourage you to respond? Come down to this altar, allow people to pray with you and for you, and hear from God yourself this morning. God is here and he wants to meet with you. Continuing in verse eight, and he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? He's asking questions that he knows the answer to. Sometimes God speaks to us in questions. Is God asking you questions today that he knows the answer to? She responds, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. So he calls her by name. God knows you by name. He knows exactly everything that is going on in your life and he's not surprised by it. He sees your struggles. He sees your mistakes, he sees your victories, and he decides in the midst of dysfunction, in the midst of the mess, in the midst of the joys and the good and everything to come and call Hagar by name and then he begins to minister to her. He will find you and he will minister to you. But ministry, I want you to note this, ministry from the Lord doesn't always involve things that you want to hear. Sometimes we, we come to the altar and we're like, oh, I just can't wait for like God's like blessing and his grace to like, just, I just feel those Holy Spirit goosebumps and I just need to be reminded of how much God loves me. And God wants to do that and he wants to remind you of that. But before he does that, sometimes he comes to you and he speaks to you something that you don't wanna hear. He's, you're in the season and, and, and you're down here and you're like, God, just pour out your love. I just need to be refreshed so that I can keep on doing things my own way. And he's like, how about I just call you to a season of enduring? How about you stay put where you're at in your workplace? I know it's a lot of pain, but I've got you there for a purpose. And ministry doesn't always involve things that we want to hear. Sometimes the best ministry that God can provide for us is when he speaks to us things that we need to hear. Have you ever had to speak that to a child in, in your parenting? Where it's like, buddy, I know you just want me to hold you in your arms, but I gotta tell you some hard truth right now. And I hope you heed it. I hope you hear it. Verse 10, the angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. And he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all of his relatives. Now this sounds similar to the promise that God gave Abram, right? This is God just honoring his promise to Abram, even though there's a mistake, even though he's, Sarai and him took matters into their own hands. The difference is that Hagar's son will multiply in descendants, but he's not the child of the promise. He's, Ishmael is, is not the child of the promise, and because he's not, the savior of the world will not come from his lineage. It comes from Isaac later, not from Ishmael. 
In fact, the Islamic faith traced their lineage back to Abram, but through Ishmael. Now, some people have said that this is a direct result of Sarai and Abram's sin. And I want to be very clear this morning. While it is true that Ishmael is a result of man doing things their own way, it was never God's will or intention that the Islamic faith would be formed. The Islamic faith is not a direct result of Abram and Sarai's sin. The deception, and the the reason why, stick with me, the deception of the Islamic faith started 2,500 years after Ishmael was around. 2,500 years after his birth is when Islam uh, began. It just so happened that their great descendant was Ishmael. I have met plenty of people that have come from a very godly lineage that at some point in time become deceived. And, and they believe a lie from Satan and begin to live a life differently than they, way they were brought up and raised. There have been plenty of godly men and women that come from godly lineages that at some point become deceived and they follow something else. You think of Jehovah's Witness being a perfect example. God's uh, de- or excuse me, deception happens all the time, and it just so happens that it happened through the bloodline of Ishmael. Now, I want you to hear me because this is the point, okay? God's desire was that Ishmael be raised under Abram's influence. That was God's desire. Why would God send Ishmael in utero, Hagar, back under Abram's rule and reign. God's desire was for Ishmael and Isaac to live together serving the same God. In fact, in Genesis 25, I believe, when when Abram dies, both Ishmael and Isaac go to bury their father. There was good relationship there. I spoke with Dr. Nunley this week about this, and, and he agrees with me. Hagar and Ishmael were a glimpse of God's heart. They were a glimpse of an evangelistic nation. God saying, even though you're not my chosen people, you can be a part of the family of God. Us as Gentiles, we're not his chosen people, but we're a part of the family of God. Abraham clearly loved Ishmael. In chapter one, he is grieved when he sends away his son. Abram's heart was for his son and to be a part of his family. And so we as Christians should be looking at Muslims with the same heart of God and the same heart as Abram. We should be looking at them with love in our hearts, longing for them to return to the camp and submit to the reign and rule of Yahweh. God's heart was and always is reconciliation. God's heart was and always is reconciliation. Musicians, would you come? We're almost done here, and then we're gonna respond. Verse 13, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Barad. So we've talked a lot about Hagar. We've talked a lot about um, Sarai and Abram, but let's talk about God, right? He sees you in our distress, in your distress. He hears your cries. He sees you in your misery. He speaks truth And he knows what's best for you. His heart is reconciliation. His heart is peace. And he longs for families to be at peace. Even in the midst of brokenness and dysfunction. I'll put it this way. Even in the midst of divorce and remarriages, God longs for there to be peace and reconciliation and he longs for people to worship him. His promises are good and true, 
We see this as we look out throughout history and we see the promise that was made to him through, uh, through Isaac and through Ishmael. And you see these descendants that are too great to count. Millions and billions of people. And even though he set apart Abram and his descendants, his heart, we see this about God in this text, his heart is for all people, for an Egyptian slave, someone that is definitely not Jewish, someone that's definitely not a part of Abram. His heart still broke for Hagar. He found her in the wilderness and he begins to speak to her and minister to her and he calls her back to unity Would you stand this morning? In just a moment, I'm gonna invite people to come forward and be prayed for and seek God. And I I believe that the Lord has been nudging on people's hearts. And, And whether you respond to this part or there's something that the Lord has just been dealing with you, can I just encourage us? God wants to bring healing to you. He wants to pour his wisdom out on you. If you're feeling desperate and you're just like, I don't know what to do. He wants to give you an insight and endurance and strengthen you and speak to you. And if you have a need, be ready to respond. Will you close your eyes? Maybe you, you, you feel like you're at the road of sure and you've hit a wall and you can kind of relate with Hagar. You're standing at the edge of this rock face of this mountain thinking, how am I going to do this? You're running. I believe that people run for a lot of reasons. You know, we see in this text that Hagar ran because she was hurting. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been hurt by family members, by friends, by your past. Maybe you were hurt by church people or a pastor or a leader or someone that you respected. And you just say this morning, I need God to turn his face upon me and I need to hear his voice because in the midst of my hurt, I don't know where I'm gonna go because I'm at a wall. And if that's you with every eye closed and head bowed, you say, I'm, I'm not at peace because of hurt in my life. Would you just raise your hand? I just wanna pray for you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, is there any others? Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Jesus, bring healing. Other people are are running and they run because of sin. And they're embarrassed and ashamed. You feel trapped or you feel dirty and, and Satan is trying to reshape your identity based upon your shortcomings rather than upon who God says you are in this morning. You need the Lord to speak to you and remind you that you're a child of the king and you'd say that sin has got you at a place of desperation just with every eye closed and head bowed would you just raise your hand if that's you and you just say I just feel beat up today I feel like I'm losing the battle is there anyone here yeah 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 yes there's also pride see it manifested in lots of different ways where you're just like self-made your plan your way and your time and you've tried this by yourself and you feel exhausted you feel burned out and you need the wisdom of God you need the strength of God to carry you on and you're just like I'm, I'm done trying I'm done running I'm, I'm choosing to run to the arms of the father and if that's you this morning you say I'm, I'm done doing things my own way Would you just raise your hand and just say, I need God's strength. I need God's wisdom. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Thank you, Jesus, for your your spirit that speaks to us. God, thank you so much that you see us in the midst of our brokenness. And in the same way that you saw an Egyptian slave girl in the middle of the desert, that you see us with all that we're going through, knowing what's on the inside of us, you see us. And so Jesus, this morning, I pray that faith would rise up, that we would invite you into the midst 
of our circumstances, that in the midst of our thinking, in the midst of our very being, and we would see your hand move. So Jesus, as people come forward, I pray that as they enter the threshold of the altar, that there would be just a a blanket of your grace, a blanket of your spirit, that people would experience you and hear directly from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you come forward as we sing this?